I had such an awesome time with God last night. Um, and uh, just, just that's why the whole, um, the whole service has gone the way that it's gone so far. We need the presence of God. Amen. We need the Spirit of God Amen. in our lives. We need, we need to know. We need to know what we have. We need to know, we need to know God. We need to know God. Amen. Yeah. We don't need to know about Him. We need to know God. Amen. When was Jerry? Jerry blessed me one day. Hello, Jerry. Bless me. He says, we must stop saying I believe in God and start believing God. <laughs> believing in God and believing God is different. We need, to, we need to believe God. We need to know God. We need to walk with God. We need to acknowledge the presence of His Spirit. I was just, I was just praying. I said, Lord, last night, um, you know, I need to... We, the things that Jesus told His disciples about, you know, He used to say, don't worry about what you'll say because, um, you know, when you're taken in front of courts and whatever because the Spirit of God will speak. And I'm praying that. I said, Lord... This church today, can, can we do that? Can I do that? And I, I just prayed and next thing I, I just, um, you know that the Bible roulette, I always joke about it. Bible roulette, you just, Lord speak. And it just opened up on that page, that exact one that I was reading, or that I was praying, and it opened on that page and it says, the Spirit will speak on your behalf. And I, and I, and I, and I realized, my goodness, we need to, we need to lay more of an emphasis on the Spirit of God. You know, it's great to be in a church where we have lights and good sound and good musicians and we have all of these good things, nice things. But so often that can be the crutch when there's no presence. Yeah, yeah. That can be a crutch when there's no Spirit. Yeah. I remember being in a, in, a, in, a, in a place where we were supposed to worship and the power went off in the middle of a worship session and nobody knew what to do <laughs> nobody knew what to do because there was no there was no music there was no flashy lights or smoke or or um, it was just us and you know no pretense and we need to we need to lay more emphasis on the spirit on our friend that is with us amen so yeah, so today is going to be a bit of a different message than normal. Um, than the last while, you know what we've been speaking about. I laughed so much, I'll just share. But this, this last while, we've, we've had so much good times because we've been preaching harvest, you know. Harvest, harvest, harvest. Good, preach it. Think about it all the time. Be mindful of the harvest. Jesus said we must think harvest, you know. So we must see harvest. And... Um, I lost this guy, phones me, or sends me a message this week. It was so awesome. He says, I just see, he sends a message, he says, looks like I've got like this farming clothes with a little farming, what's this little, looks like lucerin or whatever in my mouth, and with a massive harvest of fruit. He says, he just wants to let me know it's a fruitful time. I said, yeah, I know, we've been preaching it for the last two months. So we keep preaching it, and we keep believing it, and we keep expecting it. Amen. Amen. It's going to be great. Oh, man, I'm ready, man. So, so yeah, when God, when God spoke to me last night so nicely and pointed out, this is the words that He said to me. I've never left you. And I, and I wanted to just say that over the church today. God says, I've never left you. I have never left you. I've never left you. You know, sometimes we, we think that God leaves us. He doesn't leave us. We lose, we lose zeal, not because, not because it's God's responsibility. You must burn. <laughs> he ignites you. You need to keep it burning. So let's, let's... And then from there, it's like, w w when the Spirit speaks, you've got your message. That's it. You don't need to, you don't need to prepare. <laughs> you don't need to do... It's just, okay, Lord, I know exactly what to do. So I'm just going to go with what, what the Spirit um, did in my heart. And so we're going to go for, from there. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Put your umbrellas down. Take your seatbelts off. And enjoy the Word of God.
free fall, jump, enjoy. Romans 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren and sistren, and beg of, beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service and spiritual worship. I like that. You know, sometimes we don't realize what worship is. Worship is not just the songs we sing. Yeah. <laughs> worship is your life. How you live your life. How you do your work. Uh, you know, that's worship. He says, present your body as a living sacrifice. It's quite amazing. As there's, there's um, revelation progresses as time proceeds. It's, it's amazing that the Bible highlights that Noah was a righteous man, but it doesn't just say that Noah was a righteous man. It says Noah was a righteous man in his generation. And so there's certain things that change over time. Mornay and I were having, where's Mornay? You have us here. My leadership sitting there in the back of the church. Ah, Sinjela. All you know, one of the best. So Monet, Monet and I were having a, a, a <laughs> I'm a bad pastor. It's good. <laughs> you ever seen a colored blush? Look where. <laughs> so um, we were having a, a discussion on Friday and he was telling me that we were talking about some of the, the most influential people in our lives. And he was saying one of his favorites is Billy Graham. Now everyone would have, I think if, you've, if you know Jesus, if you've had a relationship with God at least for maybe a year or two, you would have heard of Billy Graham. Billy Graham was, was so awesome and, and uh, he had such awesome motives. And, but the question is, would Billy Graham be as, as um, influential today as what he was back in, this, in that time? And not with maybe, m maybe, but he'd, his message would be slightly different. Not, not, not a different Jesus, not a different repentance. But, like I said, we don't go into World War II with World War I's weapons. That over time, revelation proceeds, uh, progresses, and, and God gives us certain gifts and things to say in our generation and in our time. Okay, if you're struggling to, 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 to understand what I'm trying to say, is there's different questions being asked today than what they were 30, 30 years ago. Yeah. And we know the answer is Jesus. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's different. It's, our application is going to be different. So what I'm trying to say is we need to constantly um, present ourselves as a living sacrifice. Hear what the Spirit says today. It needs to be a living thing. Okay? Amen? So, just so you guys know, I'm a big fan of Billy Graham. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we, we need to hear what God says. If, you, if we copy and paste what Billy Graham did, we won't be so successful. We need today's inspiration in our generation to speak. Amen? So, he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And he doesn't say as a sacrifice because that means that you would have to die. Imagine if he didn't put living there. How many people would have taken that scripture out of proportion and went and sacrificed themselves? But he says, a living sacrifice, which means he wants you to love. God wants you to love. Amen. Amen. Okay, God wants you to have life and enjoy life to the full, fullest. Okay, so he says, so think about a sacrifice. And whenever I read this, I'm thinking about the showdown that Elijah had with the, with the Baal priests. And he says, okay, well, you pray to your God and I'll pray to mine. And you know the, the whole story. They, they prayed and Elijah watched them and how he mocked them. And I think the message translation actually says, is your God on the toilet or something like that because he's not answering. That's the kind of thing. And Elijah comes and he prays. And the Bible says that this, this fire came and it consumed everything. Okay? Now, when I think about becoming a living sacrifice, I like to think that that's the kind of fire <laughs> that God wants us to burn with. Amen? That He wants to consume 
you. He wants to consume your life. Okay. Um, someone said something so beautifully as well. Um, it was John the Baptist who said, I must decrease so that he must increase. Now, before you say amen to that, I must decrease so that he must increase. Someone just said something beautiful. He said, um, we like to say more of me and uh, less of me and more of him. He says, but God had less of you before and he didn't like it. <laughs> he wants more of you and we need more of him. So in other words, we need to learn to give ourselves over and over and learn to receive more and more of him. I think that's beautiful. I think it says so, so nicely. He loves you. Amen. So he says, now let's, okay, you know the whole story in, in, in Romans 12 verse 2. Don't be conformed to this world. You know what conform means? If you take conform and you conform to the world, then it means everybody looks the same. But if you say be transformed, that means you're different. So we have a world that is conformed and then he says don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the entire renewal of your mind. Okay, So you transform. So when I'm transformed, okay, I'm not an a, a electrician and I don't understand all these things, but... Um, if there's a transformer, you have 240 volts coming in and it's different when it comes on the out, right? So it's, it changes. That's what a transformer is for, okay? So when I transform, I'm different. I change. Good. Now listen to verse 11. He says, Never lag in zeal and in earnest endeavor be a glow and burning with the Spirit. Wow. Wow. Whoa. I love it. Don't you just love the Word of God? Yes, I like it. I like it so much. He says, don't lag in zeal. Be a glow and burning with the Spirit, serving the Lord. Be a glow. Be a glow. Don't lag in zeal. Don't lag in zeal. Be a glow. So David used to say, I encourage myself <laughs> in the Lord. You know, sometimes we need encouragement from people and it's not coming. You know, sometimes you need a pat on the back and you say, oh, well done. You know, I need to encourage myself at times and say, yeah, I'm going to burn. No one needs to help me burn. I'm going to burn for Jesus. Amen. Come on, man. Yeah. And he says, that's what you do. So he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. And you know what he does? He, he comes and he sets you on fire. You know what that's like to be on fire. Think back of that time when you just fell in love with Jesus. It was a Jonathan Butler. Oh, it's a beautiful song. Go listen to it. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever, ever done. And that moment when you fall in love with Jesus, oh my goodness, nothing else matters. Nothing else is important. You just feel, wow, full of God. And so, you know, as time progresses, all of a sudden we tend to think a little bit more smarter and we think we're clever and we lose that, that, that awe. But he says, no, be a glow. So he sets you on fire and you need to keep yourself burning. <laughs> you need to apply the Spirit. You need to apply the tools of the Word and believe the right things and stay aglow and stay burning for Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, all right. Thank you, Father. All right, so now we're going to go, um, we're going to go to 1 Timothy. It's lacquer to be on fire for God. I said it this morning. We, you might seem wise, but you'll never move mountains. Without the Spirit of God, without us yielding to the Spirit, without us being a childlike fool, you know, without us, you might look wise, 
but you'll never move mountains. You'll never experience the supernatural. You will never experience the joy of the supernatural if you stand back and, well, that's not for me. You'll never, you'll never, do, you'll never succumb to anything in the faith without becoming a fool and relying more on Jesus and relying on the Spirit. You'll never experience the supernatural yeah. without becoming like a child. Yeah. Okay, verse, verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. He says, That is why I would remind you, Paul says, to stir up, rekindle the embers of, fan the flame, and keep burning the gracious gift of God, the inner fire that is in you. So he says there's a fire in you, but he says, hey, you stir it up. You kindle the embers off. Fan that flame that's on the inside of you. Get that thing burning. Get that thing burning. Fan the flame. You know, have you ever, for those who don't know how to pray in the Spirit, you can, you can do it. I believe in praying in the Spirit. But I also believe that people can think they're praying in the Spirit and they're not praying in the Spirit. Um, but have you, ever, have you ever started by praying in the Spirit? And you just keep on praying. That you never stay in the same mindset <laughs> when you're praying. You can, you can start. <sighs> and then you start putting yourself in. And before you know it, you, you, you're praying. You, you're by praying in the Spirit. I love how when Jesus went to, went to, the, um, went to the, the tomb of Lazarus. Oh man, the Bible is so descriptive about what Jesus did. He says he stood in front and just after he wept, the Bible says Jesus wept. The Bible says that he started making strange noises. <laughs> and, it's, and I think the Amplified describes it as like, like a war horse. Like, so Jesus does just start going, oh, have you ever done that? Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Oh, God. There was a Methodist preacher who preached a message on, Oh God, where is the Oh God? It's like, Oh God. You know, it's when you pray, and you, it's in, from the inside. That is praying in the Spirit. It really is. It's praying, it's praying things that your mind doesn't understand. That you don't know how to pray. And it's just, Oh God. The Bible says that the Spirit makes utterances on behalf of His saints. It says with deep groanings that cannot be uttered. Oh God, I don't know how to pray. But when you start praying that, the Bible says he starts praying on your behalf. Woo! On the saint's behalf. And the Spirit starts interceding. I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to do that. But you need to fan the flame. That, great, that gift that is on the inside of you, you need to keep it burning. Amen. Go to Ephesians. Ephesians, so... Um, some, some of the greatest experiences that I've had with, with God, with Jesus, started with prayers of honesty, of being as honest with Him as what I possibly can, and saying stuff I don't understand. I'm, right now, I need you to, to speak to me. And, and being real honest, and I'll tell you some of the coolest stories where God speaks to me through that and, and ways of that. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. I hope that this, this message inspires you to, to do it and to apply it. Oh man. Oh man. Verse 20. Okay, wait. Let's, let's, let's read from verse 17. Do a bit of Bible reading. He says, So this I say and solemnly testify in the name of the Lord as in the presence, that you must no longer live as a heathen, do in the perverseness. Verse 18. Their moral understanding is darkened. Their reasoning is beclouded. Have you, 
especially today, with, all, with the information, the age of information, the reasoning that happens. People reason the whole time, trying to reason their way into understanding God, trying to reason their, their, their way into faith, or they, you can just reason your way out of faith. You know, um, um, there's so many movements, you know, it's like, like, like vegans, I like the, like the food thing, that's cool, I like that. But then people say, you know, why would God? Why would a loving God? That's reasoning. It's not from a, a, a position of, of faith, it's reasoning. So you never reason your way, okay? Let, let's carry on. In this, verse 19, In their spiritual apathy, they have become callous and past feeling and reckless and have abandoned themselves to sensuality, eager, greedy to indulge in every form of impurity. Verse 20, listen, you did not so learn Christ. Now, this is probably the most beautiful scriptures around. Verse 21, Assuming that you've really heard him and have been taught by him, all truth is in Jesus. Wow. Amplified. Look at it. It says, embodied and personified in him. How beautiful is that? Truth. What is truth, Pilate says? Truth was standing in front of Pilate. <laughs> embodied. <laughs> all truth is in Jesus. If you want to know what God's heart is towards you, you look to Jesus. Amen. If there's something you don't understand about God, you look to Jesus. All truth is, is personified and embodied in Him. But now listen here, verse 22. Strip yourselves of your former nature. Put off and discard your old unrenewed self, which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lusts and desires that spring from delusion. So he says, it's amazing how he puts it. He says, here's Jesus. That's the truth. He says, now strip yourself <laughs> from your former life. The things that characterize you. Strip yourselves from that. Oh, that's just the way I am. Stop saying stuff like, oh, that's how I am. That's how I've always been. In, in faith, we don't say stuff like that. <laughs> in faith, we look to Jesus. And we see the truth of who we are in Christ Jesus. And we, and we begin to leave the old life behind us. You know, while I read this last night, I saw like a little um, uh, caterpillar that, you know, becomes a butterfly. And he wants to go back into his cocoon. And so much of us Christians, we want to stay there. You know, imagine if we just give over to Jesus. To, if we just give over to, uh, to his life. Imagine how easy it will be to say to someone, I love you. Mm. Have you ever seen where you love people, but you don't want to tell them that you love them? Why not? Why not? Why don't tell your family, I love you, oh, but they've hurt me. But you do love them. Allow the Spirit of God just to be the Spirit through you. Mm. And say, I love you. I love you. It's who you are. Don't go back to, well, that's just how I am. He says, strip yourselves of your former nature. Put off and discard your, your old unrenewed self, which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lusts and desires that spring from delusion. I like that. And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, in the fresh mental spiritual attitude, put on the new nature created in God's image. This is beautiful. I don't think we, this is so cool. This is, this is awesome. He says you need to put on the new nature, which is God's image. Now, oh man. This is cool. He wants us to put on God's image. But I thought we were made in the image of God. We were made in the image. The Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, He says, God has fashioned you for this clothing. He's fashioned you. He's designed you to wear a clothing. 
And so he says, let us make mankind after our own image. When he said that, he did it. He was like designing. This is what I want them to wear. <laughs> the image of God. And he fashioned you. He fashioned your body. He fashioned your being that you can put on God. That you can put on his spirit. That you can walk around with, the Bible says, how does it say it? It says it so nicely. It says, put on the new nature created in God's image. Okay, Amplified says, God-like in true righteousness and holiness. So what does that look like? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. It's amazing. When we try to be like Jesus, we miss it. <laughs> when we try to be like Jesus, we miss it because we can't. You can't be like Jesus. But Jesus can live through you. Amen. So this, this, the, the thing about faith is surrender. It's not, it's not, it's not like I've said it a hundred times, it's not a psychological attempt of to believe. It's surrendering. It's letting go. And when we let go and we make ourselves vulnerable, we allow God to live through us. We allow Him to live through us. So if I have a relationship issue and I want to, and I want to say the ugliest thing I want to say to the person, if I surrender and I become vulnerable to God and I become vulnerable to the person, I'll say, I love you. I love you. You know, um, I'll just touch on that. I think sometimes we can get in the stupidest arguments and dumb things to be heard to one another. You know, or well, you said this, well, I said that. Yeah. This is what I said, but you said. And we're not listening to our hearts. We're not listening to our hearts. We need to listen to our hearts. We need to listen to their heart. Yeah. When we hear something, you need to listen to their heart, their position from where they're saying things. I don't know why I'm saying that. Maybe someone is, maybe more than someone is, is, is in a place, but in a, in a vulnerable place. But that is what it is. Become vulnerable. Become the least. Allow the strength of God to come through you. Amen? Amen. Don't you think this is beautiful? That Jesus is the truth embodied. <laughs> and personified, I think it's beautiful. Be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh and mental and spiritual attitude. I want to let you know this morning that God never left you. God has never left you. I said it to you this morning, so maybe it's whole message is for you. The spirit of God has never left you. He never leaves you. We need to learn to yield more to Him. Some of the greatest lessons, some of the lessons that I learned is this thing about trying, trying to be something, trying to, in, instead of just being. I've got many lessons that I learned in Hyderabad, India. I'll share the one quickly again that I had. But one of the, one of the coolest revelations that I had one day was being in one of the most awkward spots that I've ever been in in front of the most amount of people that I've ever preached in front. I remember standing on the driving on my way to the stage where there's about 50,000 people waiting to hear me. On my way to, to this 50,000 people waiting to hear me, the pastor says, you need to demonstrate God somehow. He says, because if you can show a miracle, you'll win India. <laughs> All right. Now, I don't know if you guys know that anointing is not necessarily a feeling. <laughs> we like to feel anointed, but sometimes we need to know that we're anointed when we don't feel anointed. When you wake up in the morning and you're in a bad mood, you need to know, I'm anointed. <laughs> Even if you don't feel anointed. This day was one of the flattest days in my life. I had no enthusiasm. I was more, I wouldn't say scared. Have you ever, have you ever been, you felt, you see, when you give a lesson from pastor's perspective, you want to feel the presence of God on you. 
you want to feel like God is speaking through you. But when it's not there, when that feeling is not there, it's not a nice place to be in. And it's, very, it's not a good place to be in when you be, be on international television in front of 50,000 people. And the pressure is on you to perform. And I, I remember standing on that stage. And I, they placed the demand on the anointing that day. Here comes this guy from South Africa. And I stand there and I'm like, I do not know what to say. I've been in a, you know when you're talking, your mouth is moving and there's words coming out your mouth, but in your mind it's like, oh God, what am I doing? What am I saying? Have you been there before? That day it was like that. Hey? Yeah. So now I'm standing there and I'm thinking, God, where are you? Yeah. God, where are you? And I, rem- I, ca- I can't remember what I preached. But I'm like, yes, Lord, I, I really need you. I need you right now. And uh, I had one of the most flattest, felt so flat, like nothing. And then I remember Smith Wigglesworth, what he said. He said, well, if the Holy Spirit doesn't move me, then I'm going to move the Holy Spirit. And I go, okay, Holy Spirit. So I started thinking, how can I... How can I demonstrate something? Usually when I stand in front of people, I can feel pain. I can feel, I can feel what people are feeling. I can feel if you'll, you'll pick up. Sometimes I feel, and then I'll address and I'll say. And that's the way that God speaks. But that day, that wasn't happening. Nothing was happening. <laughs> so then I'm thinking to myself, okay. The Spirit said that He'll be with me. He won't leave me. And that's when it takes a step of faith and a step of trust. And I said, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to make myself vulnerable. Meaning, I'm going to look like a fool in front of 50,000 people if you do not pitch up and help me here. And like Monet was blushing, I felt like the whole time like that. Monet. And I'm on the spot. And so I, I take my book. And this is, it's the funniest story, but it's the most awesome. I remember watching an Indian program with my dad on SABC3. Do you remember the Kumars? Yeah. Remember the Kumars? How many guys remember the Kumars? Kumars. Anyway, and I thought about some Indian names of all the, all the names that I thought of. And I thought, I thought of Raj and I thought of... So that in my mind, I'm writing, I'm taking a book and I'm writing the name of this person. Raj. And I thought, I looked at these people and they say, I, I know they stay in flats. There's flats and flats and flats. And, I, and I, um, I'm going to share some of these things. They were so cool. Some of the testimonies. I'm going to, um, and, and it's a flat. And then I would pick a random sickness, cancer. And I would say, your name is Raj. <laughs> you live in flat number so and so and so. And you've been diagnosed with cancer. And I just throw it out. You know, it's like fishing. You just throw it out there and I just see if something bites. Boom. Bite. Here comes this guy out. It's true. It's true, Pastor. It's true. <laughs> I knew it. In the meantime, it was a wild guess. It was completely wild. It was... So I thought, well, that worked well. Let's do it again. So I did it. And I did it. And time after time, they would come out. I remember the one guy comes to, to the front and he says, he says to me, um, he says, he looks, I look at him and he looks a little bit over, like overweight, but now the whole time I'm thinking about soccer. I'm thinking, do Indian play soccer? <laughs> so I say, you're a captain. So he says, yes, pastor. <laughs> and uh, soccer. Yes, pastor. And I thought, wow. And everyone was going wild. I asked this other guy. I said, I see you walking around in the streets. Your, 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 your church name starts with Emmanuel. It's a good... They came out. People would say, is it true? Is it true? And it was true. And I realized we don't realize our union with God. Yeah. And how one we are with God. Yeah. And how 
that when we actually trust God, yeah. yes, it's powerful. Yeah. It's more powerful than what we, than what we realize. Yeah. And if we begin to realize the union, the oneness, where Jesus said in John 14, hey, in that day you will know that I am in you and that you are in me, and that I am in my Father and my Father is in me, and that we are one. In John 17, he actually goes into prayer and says, and you'll be one because I am in you and you're in them. Come on, church. Amen. What can we do? What can we do when we begin to yield more to the Spirit of God? To yield more in our decision making. When we, when we do something, knowing God, I don't know, but I'm trusting you. I'm going to take this step. You know? There were times, there were times in, the, in the Bible where the disciples and the apostles would go. And then the Spirit would stop them. And sometimes in the church, we're always finding out, Lord, what is your will? What is your will? Instead of just going with what we have and trusting God that if we, that He'll stop us if we make a mistake. Come on. I hope it's helping you. It is. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. All right. Let's, two more scriptures and we're finished. Um, Ephesians chapter 5. Homework, just go read Ephesians. All of it. It's 10 minutes you threw it. It's a really good book. Ephesians chapter 5. He says in verse 26. Verse 26, so that he might sanctify her. Okay, it starts from verse 25. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her. One of the most dangerous things that I think is coming from the pulpit is when we are telling people, hey, you need to purify yourself. How are you going to purify yourself? Now, I know stuff like saying stuff that, you know, is coming back for a pure and spotless bride. But this one says, He sanctifies you. He purifies you. You don't don't purify yourself. You don't have the authority to do that. You You can't do that. You can try. You can try to act, to live, to live righteously. It's an outside external thing. The Word of God comes and it deals with the heart. And it cleanses the heart. And it deals with the motives. And it's constantly washing. So how do you sanctify yourself? The Word comes and washes you. So you just need to position yourself to be sanctified. Just sit in the right place and let the Word of God wash you. We told today, how many people we come to church on full lack of meals, full fail. We've been through a week where we've been in bad discussions we've overheard people say ugly things and it's yeah it's in your subconscious and it makes you feel dirty you put on the tv you saw something ah, that you you feel filthy you know you it's not lacquer or whatever it is or you had an argument with some you feel dirty but then you sit under the word and the word just washes you Whew. come in the worship and the worship is just wow i'm cleansed i'm free so he says so that he might sanctify her Having cleansed her, having cleansed her, it doesn't say that he will, it actually says that he's cleansed you. <laughs> he's cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present the church to himself. Yeah, he might present the church, not you present yourself. He'll present you. Amen, that's good. Let's finish in John 16. John 16. John is my favorite gospel. I love the gospel of John. It's, it, when you read it, it feels like you're there. It's, it's such a, it's, John, yeah, he's got this awesome way of just revealing Christ through his epistles and through his gospels. Really good. All right. Thank you, Jesus, for your words. Thank you for your words. And then, yeah, we're finishing. 
All right, check this out. John 16, verse 7, and then we'll finish. I'm telling you is nothing but the truth when I say it is profitable that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comforter will not come to you. Yo, say thank you God. <laughs> for all of us still waiting for Jesus to come, remember he said, if I don't go, <laughs> I can't send you the Spirit. And he actually said, hey, it's profitable. It's expedient. It's to your advantage that I go. Meaning, remember, that the fact that you have the Spirit right now, according to Jesus, is better than if you were here in the flesh. <laughs> Not according to me. According to Jesus. He says, Lord, help me understand. Help me make more use of your Spirit. I hope you caught that. When He comes, listen, He will convict and convince the world. Stop there. Does He convict you or does He convince the world? Think about that. They say God, the Spirit of God is going to convict you about sin. No, He's going to convict the world about sin. He's going to convince and convict the world about judgment and about righteousness. When He comes to you, when He's on you, when He's remaining in and on you, it's a conviction and a convincing to the world. <laughs> I love that. He's not going to point out your sin. He's going to point out righteousness. You are righteous. <laughs> And to the world, to the sinners, they realize, my goodness, this is what I'm looking for. It's a bit of a different angle, because he doesn't convict you, he, conv he convicts the world. Verse 12, sin, righteousness, and judgment, that's 11, you can read that. Verse 12, I have still many things to say to you, and we'll close there. Jesus says, I have still many things to say to you. He wants to speak to you. At that time he said, I'm not going to tell it to you. The Spirit of God is going to tell it to you. So, the Spirit wants to speak to you. He has many things to say to you. The Spirit of God wants to say things to you. So here's my advice. As a pastor, I believe it's also my advice to give a how-to. Don't complicate the voice of God. Don't complicate it. Sometimes we hear people saying things, they, the Spirit of God came and He said this and He said that. And I don't, Personally, I don't ever hear, Bruce, my son, never hear it like that. The Spirit of God speaks into your heart, into your, to your conscience, to your soul. And sometimes you don't understand if it's me or if it's God. Right? Don't complicate it. And, and that being said, I'm not saying that God won't speak to you in a deep, loud voice out of the... He might. <laughs> but mostly, He doesn't. Mostly, He doesn't. Mostly, He speaks to you through His Spirit. And you stand and you speak. Um, you'll understand like that. Um, about praying in the Spirit, I want to give you this tip as well. When I was uh, um, 14 years old, 15 years old, 15, I heard people say that when they started praying in the Spirit, they saw this big vision. And I always waited for a vision before I would speak in, speak in the Spirit. And it never came to me like that. Until the day I just said, Lord, I want to do it. I want to speak fully with your Spirit. And I just started doing it. Don't let other people's stories complicate how God wants to man bring a manifestation to you. Trust in what it says. And say, my goodness, if this is the church's inheritance, it is my inheritance. Amen. Some of the best experiences I've had was in church. Some of the others was in, in my room or outside or at the sea. <laughs> I need to go again. So, so yeah, trust God. Come on, let's, let's, let's be a spirit-filled church. Let's be a, a people full of God. Amen. Let's be, be a people full of God. We always said, yeah... Um, in our meetings that my focus should not be to get the church full although we would like a church full my, my focus should be to have a church full of Jesus Amen. a people full of God a people full of the Spirit if we can do that we'll have a massive impact around us on a daily basis Amen, Amen. 
So God doesn't want your heart full of cares and burdens. God doesn't want your, your heart full of offenses. God doesn't want your heart full of anxiety. God wants your heart full of His Spirit. Full of the, like the fruit of the Spirit. Joy, love, peace gentleness come on read it make it yours that's your inheritance if it's not allow the word of god to wash you and say lord i'm letting go amen a big honest but a necessary word a really necessary word a very very important word amen, amen. come let's stand and pray together Hebrews 13, verse 6b. Jesus says, I will not, I will not, he repeats it, I will not in any way leave you, nor forsake you. And he says, nor relax my hold on you. He says, I will not, I will not, assuredly not. <laughs> he repeats it. So we need to, Lord, if, if in our consciousness we have lost touch with you today we look to you today we acknowledge you holy spirit father that you are with us that you never left us that you are here right now and i thank you father you've called each individual each one of us to know you intimately to not know about you, to know you. To walk in a relationship with the Spirit of God. Where you reveal things to us that you know, has not been seen or heard. Was never came into the heart of my man. I pray, Lord, that we'll be full of zeal for you. That we'll burn for you. That we'll be aware of you. That we'll be conscious of you inside. And that we'll know... <laughs> whether we feel good or whether we don't, that we are anointed, that we are set apart, that we have been washed in the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's your prayer. I was just thinking, you know, Samson, when, when the last time when Delilah said, the Philistines are upon you, and he's hair was cut and the anointing was not there he still got up and fought (laughs) meaning if he had known if the anointing was a feeling he would have known immediately (laughs) think about it but we know that the bible says that 1 john chapter 2 i think verse 27 says but the anointing which you have received abides permanently in you permanently Amen.